Hello everyone, Biochemia Web Channel is here with the topic titled Carbohydrates 3. Do not forget to like the video before you start watching it, my friend. I wish it to be useful. Let's start. What are the contents of this topic? Introduction to polysaccharides. And then we will look to the classes of polysaccharides. The one is homopolysaccharide starch, glycogen, cellulose, dextrans, chitin, inulin. And the second class is heteropolysaccharide, hyaluronic acid, chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, heparin sulfate, heparin, heptidoglycan, agar, gum arabic, and hex. The majority of carbohydrates found in nature are the polymers of monosaccharides or disaccharide units, which we call them polysaccharides. They are polymers with medium to high molecular weight, such as 20,000 Dalton. Polysaccharides, also known as glycans, differ in the identity of the repeated monosaccharide units chain length, bond types, joining the units, and branching degree. Homo and heteropolysaccharides are the classes of polysaccharides. They may be composed of one, two, or several different monosaccharides in straight or branch chains of varying length. And they are not sweet, as in mono and disaccharides. And here you see a unbranched homopolysaccharide and look at the color which each hexagonal diagram represents a monomer, represents a monosaccharide and they are all identical. This is a homopolysaccharide, an unbranched one. And this is a branched homosaccharide, homo homopolysaccharide or homoglycan. And look at this shape. The colors are different. So this is a unbranched heteropolysaccharide consists of two different repeating disaccharide units. This is a disaccharide unit, which contains a two different monomers. And at the end, this is a multiple monomer. Look at the colors, there are three different types of monomers, and it's a branch type of heteropolysaccharide. So a polysaccharide may be unbranched or branched homo polysaccharide, or two monomer unbranched, or maybe branched, multiple monomer branch heteropolysaccharide. Now you know that there are two subclasses of polysaccharides. As I mentioned in the previous page, homo and heteropolysaccharides. Homopolysaccharides consist of only one type of monomeric species, only one type of monosaccharide. Some homopolysaccharides serve as storage forms of monosaccharides that are used as fuels. A good example is starch and glycogen. And other homopolysaccharides, such as cellulose, chitin, serve as structural elements in plant cell walls and animal exoskeletons, animal exoskeletons, such as kidney. Heteropolysaccharides contain two or more different monomeric species, and heteropolysaccharides provide extracellular support for organisms of all kingdoms. For example, for example, the rigid layer of the bacterial cell envelope, which is the peptidoglycan, is composed in part of a heteropolysaccharide built, built from two alternating monosaccharide units. In animal tissues, the extracellular space is occupied by several types of heteropolysaccharides, which form a matrix that holds individual cells together and provides protection, shape, and support to cells, tissues, and organs. 
surely we can say true polysaccharides are the supportive uh, polysaccharides or supportive they have a supportive function uh, and they are the carbohydrates these are good examples that I always like to say. The carbohydrates are more than energy, more than energy. Polysaccharides in general lack distinguishing molecular weights. As we know, proteins are synthesized on a template, messenger RNA, RNA of defined sequence and length by enzymes that follow the template exactly. For polysaccharide synthesis, there is no template. Rather, the program for polysaccharide synthesis is interesting to the enzymes that catalyze the polymerization of the monomeric unit, and there is no specific stopping point in the synthetic process. The product does vary in length. Starch is the most significant sutorage polysaccharide in plant cells, and glycogen is the most essential sutorage polysaccharide in animal cells. Both polysaccharides are formed in intracellulary as big clusters or granules because they have many exposed hydroxyl groups that can hydrogen bond with water. Starch and glycogen molecules are highly hydrated. Most plant cells have the ability to form starch, and starch storage is especially abundant in tubers, such as potatoes and in seeds. Monosaccharides derivative can also participate in the structure of polysaccharides. Not only the monosaccharide, also its derivatives, the derivatives such as chitin, a homopolysaccharide composed of glycosamine unit, which we know the glycosamine, remember from the previous topics, is an amino acid. Or look at the hyaluronic acid, a heteropolysaccharide composed of glycosamine and glycoronic acid but it's in an acetylated form that we will look later deeply. And here is a table showing you the polysaccharides we will study under this topic. And firstly, we will start with homopolysaccharides, starch, glycogen, cellulose, dextran, chitin, inulin, and then we will follow the heteropolysaccharides starting from hyaluronic acid and ends in pectin. And as you see here, some are sulfated. Some are sulfated. And in general, in heteropolysaccharides, mostly they consist of uh, they consist of monosaccharide derivatives. Let's start with homopolysaccharides. Such glycogen, cellulose, and the other ones. Polysaccharides compromise the single type of monosaccharide or monosaccharide derivative as monomers are known as homopolysaccharides. As a general naming, the suffix an is used instead of os. When all units are glucose, homopolysaccharide is called glycan. If all units are kisolose, so the homopolysaccharide is called kisolan. If all units are mannose, it will be mannane. If all units are galactose, it will be galactose. So let's be careful here, my friends. So see, according to this nomenclature, the homopolysaccharide of glycose is glycan. However, the name glycan is generally used for all polysaccharides. On the one hand, there are three different homopolysaccharides consisting of glucose monomers, cellulose, glycogen, and starch. All are glycan, but it's not a distinctive for them. Therefore, we use the common names most of the time. And the first polysaccharide, the first homopolysaccharide is starch. Starch is a carbohydrate consisting of a long chain of glucose molecules. It is a common source of energy in the human diet, diet and is found in many staple foods such as potatoes, rice, wheat, and corn. Starch is a homopolysaccharide, which means it's composed of multiple sugar glucose molecules linked together. It's one of the primary storage forms of energy in plants. 
serving as a reservoir of glycos that can be broken down and used for fuel when needed. Amylose and amylopectin are two forms of glucose polymers found in starch. So this means there are two distinctive uh, parts of starch or types of starch, amylose and amylopectin. So don't confuse with the enzyme amylase. Enzyme amylase. It's an enzyme, but it relates to starch. Hydrolytic enzyme of starch. So amylose is a form of starch. Amylase is an enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolytic cleavage of uh, glycosidic bonds in amylose and amylopectin, as we will look later. Amylose is made up of long, unbranched chains of d glucose residues linked together by alpha 1 4 glycosidic linkage, similar to maltose. And also, we say the maltose is a disaccharide unit of starch. Amylopectin has a high molecular weight up to 200 million, but it is extremely branched. And alpha 1 4 glycosidic links unite successive glucose residues and amylopectin chains. Alpha 1 6, be careful here, alpha 1 6 linkage or glycosidic bonds connect branch points and they occur every 24 to 30 residues. This means it starts with a, a straight chain, a linear, and at every 24 to 30, a, band, a branch point is occurred with alpha-1,6 glycosidic linkage, or glyco, uh, short linkage. And also don't forget this, D-glucose. Always D-glucose, so we can omit to say D every time. And here is the difference between amylose and amylopectin. And look at here. This is the amylose. It's a straight chain. It forms about 28 to 30 percent of starch molecules, and it contains 250 to 300 glucose units. And they all link with here. The bond type is alpha 1,4 glycosidic link. And there are long chains that are prone to spiral formation. They are prone to spiral formation. And this is the amylopectin, the second shape of the molecule, shows a branch structure. It forms about the 70% of the molecule or starch. And there are at least 180 glucose units and up to and in total up to millions. And glucose genius are linked up with alpha 1, 4 in the straight chain part, but at the branching point, it will be alpha 1, 6 linkage. And starch's counterpart in animals is glycogen, which has the same composition and structure, but with more extensive branching that occurs every 8 to 12 glucose units. But not for all, uh, not for both forms. Actually, it comes to pass with the amylopectin a form of starch. So, then compared to glycogen. And here, an illustration showing both amylose and amylopectin. A cluster of amylose and amylopectin like that believed to occur in starch granules, a cluster. And strands of amylopectin, and here as you see the purple or lavender, form double helical structures with each other or with amylose strands, seen in green. And amylopectin has a frequent branching point. And these are the branching points as is 2 alpha 1 to 6. And glucose residues at the non reducing ends of the outer branches are removed enzymatically during the mobilization of starch for energy production. It occurs with non reducing ends. And glycogen has a similar structure, but it is more highly branched and more compact.
alpha amylase, look at here, the ASEAs, it's an enzyme, it refers to an enzyme, alpha amylase and beta amylase are two different enzymes that play key roles in the digestion and metabolism of starch. These enzymes are found in various organisms, including humans and other animals, as well as in plants and microorganisms. Each enzyme has a specific function in breaking down such molecules into smaller sugar components. Alpha amylase is an enzyme that primarily cleaves the long chains of starch, both amylose and amylopectin, by breaking the alpha 1 4 glycosidic bonds between glucose molecules. And it is secreted by pancreas and salivary glands. An alpha amylase works by randomly hydrolyzing the integral bonds within the starch molecule, producing a mix of shorter oligosaccharides, maltose, and glucose. Alpha amylase is produced in various organisms, including humans, and is involved in the initial stages of starch digestion in the mouth, which we call it the salivary amylase, secreted by salivary glands, and later in the small intestine, which is provided by the pancreas. The enzyme is active under mild conditions such as those in the mouth and small intestine with an optimal pH of around 6.7 to 7.0. And also look at here, there is a question mark because and this question mark is about the existence or the presence of salivary amylase in all animals. And this is not true. Not all animals have the salivary amylase. The human and uh, the pig can pig have the salivary amylase, but for about the dog and cat, there is no salivary amylase. And beta amylase is an enzyme that specifically acts on the ends of starch molecules, cleaving the non-reducing ends of amylose and amylopectin yielding maltose. And it is commonly found in plants, particularly in cereal grains like barley and malted grains used in brewing, where it plays a crucial role in converting starch into fermentable sugars during the brewing process. So we can say the alpha amylase is an animal type of amylase and beta is a plant type of amylase. Amylose chains undergo hydrolysis upon interaction with alpha amylase, yielding a mixture of glucose and maltose. On the other hand, when subjected to beta amylase, amylose is converted almost exclusively into maltose, with this action initiated at the non reducing end. When amylopectin is exposed to amylases, it undergoes breakdown into maltose molecules, commencing at the non reducing end of molecules. This process halts when it reaches the branching point because beta amylases do not, do not act on the alpha 1, 6 glycosidic bond. And this is also the same for alpha amylase. As a result of beta amylases' inability to continue its action, the residual portion of this starch following enzyme hydrolysis is referred to as dextrin. The dextrin is a love molecular weight carbohydrate produced by the hydrolysis of starch. It consists of a mixture of polymers of glucose units, and we know it's always D, by alpha 1 4 or alpha 1 6 glycosidic bonds. And here you see the illustration of dextrin, also called limit dextrin, are formed from starch in various processes including enzymatic digestion of starch in the human body, also in melting meshing, especially to dry heat under acidic conditions and more. But the process of dextrin production was first pioneered by Atme Jean Baptiste Bouillon Lagner in 1811, and it has since found applications in diverse industries. Interestingly, dextrins can also naturally form on the surface of bread during the baking process, enhancing the bread's flavor, color, and crispiness. Dextrins generated through the application of heat are known as pyrodextrin. And dextrin typically appears as a white, yellow, or brown powder that is partially or fully water-soluble. 
when dissolved in water, it yields optically active solutions with low viscosity. Most dextrins can be identified by their reaction with iodine solution. And also, this is uh, an experiment of the starch, which will give dis distinctive colors during the hydrolysis of starch, and the, the dextrins will give a red color. And here you see the glucose unit, the glucose unit linked with alpha 1, 4 at the branch point alpha 1, 6. And think about amylase, that digest, hydrolytic. Uh, the bonds here break, 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 and when we reach alpha 1, 6, the enzyme cannot pass the, here. It's a kind of barrier, and at the end, there will be a dextrin. Dextrin. Uh, and the border of the dextrin is provided by alpha 1, 6 branching points. And the arrow shows the enzyme effect of alpha amylase. For the continuity of the degradation, we need another enzyme, an enzyme to break alpha-1-6 bonding. The branching points can only be broken by a special enzyme. The name of this enzyme is alpha-1-6 glucosidase, or shortly, the branching enzyme. Dextrins carry about 700 glucose units. Dextrin solutions are used are also used as mucilage. It is used for the feeding of children because it is easily digested and stomach prevents milk clotting. Both starch and its degradation products give characteristic colors with iodine solution. Amylose gives blue black. Amylopectin gives purple red and dextrin gives red. And smaller molecular dextrins give colorless solution. And these colors disappear when heated or reimagined when cooled. It's time for glycogen. Glycogen serves as the primary storage polysaccharide in animal cells. Like amylopectin, Glycogen is composed of glucose subunits linked through alpha-1,4 with additional alpha-1,6 branches. However, glycogen exhibits a higher degree of branching, typically occurring every 8 to 12 glucose residues, and it is more densely packed compared to starch. Glycogen is notably prevalent in the liver, where it can make up to 7% of the total wet weight. It is also present in skeletal muscle. In liver cells, hepatocytes, glycogen is stored in large granules. These granules consist of clusters of smaller granules, each composed of highly branched glycogen molecules with an average molecular weight in the range of several million. These glycogen granules also house the enzymes responsible for both glycogen synthesis and breakdown in tightly bound form. And here is an illustration of glycogen, as you see, highly branched, and also there is a special protein which is called glycogenin and then also it's an enzyme which is involved in converting glucose to glycogen. It acts as a primer by polymerizing the first few glucose molecules after which other enzymes take over. It's a homodimer of 37 kilodalton subunits and is classified as a glycosyl transferase. Glycogenin plays a crucial role in the initiation of glycogen synthesis, which is the process of creating glycogen, a storage form of glucose in animal. Glycogenin plays a critical role in glycogen metabolism, allowing for the efficient storage and mobilization of glucose in response to the energy demands of the body. It's a key player in the regulation of blood glucose levels 
and is particularly important in tissues like the liver and skeletal muscles, where glucagon serves as a ready source of energy during periods of high demand. So, there is a perfect question that must be answered. Why is glucose not stored in its individual monomeric form? And the cell stored as glycogen, as in polymeric form. To answer this, consider that Hepatocytes, liver cells, store glycogen, which is equivalent to a glucose concentration of 0.4 mole, molar concentration. However, the actual concentration of glycogen in the cell is approximately 0.01 molar concentration. This is because glycogen is insoluble and does not significantly contribute to the osmotic balance of the cytosol. If the cytosol contains 0.4 molar concentration of glucose, it would significantly increase the osmolarity, leading to the risk of excessive water entering the cell, potentially causing cell rupture. Additionally, with an intracellular glucose concentration of 0.4 molar concentration and an extracellular concentration of about 5 millimole per liter, this is a typical concentration in the blood of mammals, the energy required for glucose uptake into the cell against this enormous concentration gradient would be unfeasibly high. So, this is the answer. When glycogen is utilized for energy, glucose units are sequentially eliminated from the non-reducing enzyme. And enzymes responsible for degradation, which exclusively target non-reducing end, can concurrently operate on multiple branches, expediting the transformation of the polymer into monosaccharides. And the enzymes are glycogen phosphorylase and the branching end. And cellulose. Cellulose is a pivotal molecule in the plant kingdom, forming the structural framework of plant tissues. It ranks among the most prevalent organic compounds in nature and is abundantly present. Cellulose, a robust and water insoluble fibrous material, is a key component in the solvols of plants, primarily found in plant structures such as whole stems, trunks, and woody portions. It makes up a significant portion of woods, mass, and materials like cotton are nearly pure cellulose. In structure, cellulose resembles amylose as a linear and unbranched homopolysaccharide compromising between 10,000 to 15,000 D-glucose units. However, a crucial distinction lies in the configuration of glucose residue. In cellulose, the glucose units possess a beta configuration. However, in amylose, they have an alpha configuration. In starch, the bonding is alpha-1,4, but in cellulose, the bonding is beta 1,4. Beta 1,4 glycosidic bonds. This means the glucose residues in cellulose are, are linked, correction, are linked by beta 1,4 glycosidic bonds in contrast to alpha 1,4 bonds of amylose. This difference causes individual molecules of cellulose and amylose to fall differently in space, giving them very different microscopic structures and physical properties. The dove fibrous nature of cellulose makes it useful in such commercial products as insulation material, and it's a major constitution of cotton and linen fabric. Cellulose is also the starting material for the commercial production of cellophane and rayon. 
and don't forget the cellulose and the amylose or the starch they are the stereoisomers that we will dis that we discuss the stereoisomerism in organic chemistry so you should turn back to organic chemistry topic uh, the isomerism and stereoisomers in organic chemistry The majority of the vertebrate animals are unable to utilize cellulose as an energy source due to the absence of an enzyme required to break down the beta-1-4 linkages in the cellulose. However, termites exhibit the capability to digest cellulose, including food, because their digestive system houses a symbiotic microorganism known as trichonymphia. This microorganism produces cellulase enzyme, cellulase enzyme that can hydrolyze the beta-1-4 glycosidic bond. Molecular genetic research has uncovered the presence of genes responsible for cellulose degradating enzymes in the genomes of various invertebrate animals, including arthropods and nematodes. Ruminant animals like cattle, sheep, and goats host symbiotic microorganisms within the rumen. And these microorganisms can hydrolyze cellulase, allowing these animals to break down dietary cellulose from soft grass. And they have the cellulase. And the rumen is the first of their four stomach compartments. So, the microorganisms, they carry, digest cellulose uh, via fermentation process, which they, they generate acetate, propionate, and beta-hydroxybutyrate, the volatile fatty acid, which the animal utilizes to synthesize the sugars present in meat. And cellulose enzymes are categorized into three main types, and the gluconases, Exoglucanases, which is also called cellulobiohydrolases and the beta glucosidases. And these enzymes work together to break down the cellulose molecule into soluble sugar. And the resulting glucose can then be used as a source of energy by the organism or in various industrial processes. And here is the difference between starch, glycogen, and cellulose. As you see in the starch, there are two types. Two forms, amylose and the amylopectin, unbranched and branch form. Glycogen, it is highly branched and similar to amylopectin. And the cellulose, it's made up of unbranched straight chains. And here they having the hydrogen bonding between hydrogen chains. Dextrans. Dextrans are polysaccharides produced by bacteria and yeast, consisting of alpha 1 6 linked polyglucose chains with the alpha 1 3 branches. And some varieties of dextrans may also have alpha 1 2 or alpha 1 4 branch. But this means dextran is a complex branch glycan, a polysaccharide made of many glucose molecules. Again, a polysaccharide having many glucose molecules. And composed of chains of varying lengths from 3 to 2000 kilodaltons. Dextran is synthesized from sucrose by certain lactic acid bacteria, and the best knowing being Leconostoc mesenteroides and Streptococcus mutans. And as a footnote, dental plaque is rich in dextrans. And these carbohydrate compounds, dextrans, play a significant role in dental plaque formation. And as I said, dental plaque is rich in dextrans, where bacteria adhere to the surface and to each other. Synthetic dextrans are used in several commercial products that serve in the fractionation of proteins by size exclusion chromatography. The dextrans in these products are chemically cross-linked to form insoluble materials of various sizes. Dextrans are adhesive, 
facilitating the bacterial adhesion process and they serve as a source of glucose for bacterial metabolism. And it is also used medically as an antifrombotic antiplatelet, in other words, to reduce blood viscosity and as a volume expander in hypovolemia. Another homopolysaccharide, chitin. Chitin is a long chain polymer of an N acetyl glucosamine. Till now, we talk about the homopolysaccharides consisting of monosaccharides, but now we have a homopolysaccharide consisting of a repeating unit of a monosaccharide derivative, a derivative of glucose with beta 1 for linkages. And in this aspect, it is similar with the cellulose. But instead of glucose, chitin carry N acetyl glucosamine as a building block. And the only chemical difference from cellulose is the replacement of the hydroxyl group at the carbon 2. Remember the monosaccharide derivatives. At the carbon 2, the hydroxyl group is replaced with the amino group. Chitin is a fundamental constituent of fungal cell walls and the exoskeletons of arthropods, including crustaceans, such as crabs, lobsters, and shrimps, and insects. Chitin forms extended fibers similar to those of cellulose, and like cellulose, cannot be digested by vertebrates. Chitin is the principal component of the heart exoskeletons of nearly a million species of arthropods, and it is probably the second most abundant polysaccharide next to cellulose in nature. An estimated 1 billion tons of chitin are produced each year in the biosphere. Its versatility has found variable applications in medicine, industry, and biotechnology. And the last homopolysaccharide, inulins. Inulins are a group of naturally occurring polysaccharides produced by a variety of plant species. It belongs to a class of compounds known as fructans. Insulin consists of a chain of fructose molecules linked together by beta-1-2 glycosidic bonds. And these compounds fall under the category of dietary fibers called fructans. Inulin, a non-digestible carbohydrate, is a fructan that is not only found in many plants as a storage carbohydrate, but has also been part of men's daily diet for several centuries. It is present in many regularly consumed vegetables, fruits, and cereals, including leek, onion, garlic, wheat, artichoke, and banana. Inulin serves an energy storage mechanism for certain plants and is typically concentrated in the roots or rhizomes. Notably, plants that synthesize and store inulin often do not store other carbohydrate forms like starch. In the field of healthcare, the measurement of kidney function employing inulin is considered the gold standard for comparing with other methods of estimating glomerular filtration rate, the GVR, gold marker to assess the kidney function. Inulin and its analog sinistrin are used to help measure kidney function by determining the GVR which is the volume of fluid filtered from the kidney glomerular capillaries into the Bowman's capsule per unit of time. And my dear friends, now we have finished the homopolysaccharides. It's time for heteropolysaccharide. And we will start with hyaluronic acid, chondroitin sulfates, and then following to pectins. 
The term polysaccharides are defined as polysaccharide molecules composed of distinct types of monosaccharides. The term polysaccharides, such as hyaluronic acid, are created when hundreds of different genes of glycolonic acid and N-acetyl glucosamine combine. So here was the logic is, the principle is, they consist of different types of monosaccharides. And glycosaminoglycans, shortly GAC, GAGs, also called mucopolysaccharides, this is the formal name, but now we prefer to use the term glycosaminoglycans. The GAC are a biological significant group that includes uronic acid, either glucuronic acid or idironic acid, and amino sugars as monomers. And due to the uronic acid and acid characters in the structure, they are called mucopolysaccharides due to acid structure. But this is the formal name now. We use glycosaminoglycans, the GAC. Glycosaminoglycans are heteropolysaccharides of the extracellular matrix, such as fibrillar collagens, elastins, and fibronectin. These are the other components of extracellular matrix. It consists of specialized collagens, laminins, and heteropolysaccharides. I'm talking about the extracellular matrix. So extracellular matrix consists of specialized collagens, laminins, and heteropolysaccharides, elastins, etc. And the heteropolysaccharides, which are the glycosaminoglycans, are a family of linear polymers composed of repeating disaccharides. In the tissues of multicellular animals, a gel-like substance known as the extracellular matrix, or ground substance. And it occupies the extracellular space, shortly ECM. And this ECM serves to both connect cells and create a porous network for the distribution of essential nutrients on oxygen to individual cells. And the extracellular matrix is a complex network formed by heteropolysaccharides and fibrous proteins. So extracellular matrix has a crucial function. And it consists of glycosaminoglycans as heteropolysaccharides. The first heteropolysaccharide is hyaluronic acid, also known as hyaluronan. It consists of alternating residues of d glucuronic acid and N-acetyl glucosamine. Also, it's in D form. With as many as 50,000 repeti repetitions of this fundamental disaccharide unit, which I, I'm talking about, the disaccharide unit means the glucuronic acid plus N-acetyl glucosamine, Hyaluronan attains a molecular weight in the millions. Hyaluronan forms clear, highly viscous solutions that function as lubricants within the synovial fluid of joints and provide the vitreous humor of vertebra eyes with its gel-like texture. And hyalos, hyalos in Greek means glass as hyaluronan can appear glassy or translucent. Hyaluronan is also a key constituent of the extracellular matrix in cartilage and tendons, contributing to their tensile strength and elasticity through strong non-covalent interactions with other matrix components. Pathogenic bacteria can produce hyaluronidase enzyme, let me write slowly. There must be an A hyaluronidase. Hyaluronidase enzyme. An enzyme capable of breaking down the glycosidic linkage in hyaluronan, which in turn makes tissues more vulnerable to bacterial invasion. In numerous animal species, a similar enzyme present in sperm hydrolyzes the outer glycosaminoglycan layer surrounding the ovum, facilitating sperm penetration. 
And here with the repeating units of glycosam and glycan hyaluronic acid or hyaluronate, a component of extracellular matrix. And here you see the glycuronic acid. Look at the carboxyl group here. And, and N acetyl glycosamine. And the linkage is beta 1, 3. And the following glycuronic acid linked to N acetyl glucosamine. We are but beta 1, 4, then beta 1, 3. So this is the repeating pattern. Beta 1, 3, beta 1, 4, beta 1, 3, beta 1, 4. And n number of this pattern forms hyaluronate. Chondroitin sulfate, as you see, I use a plural sulfate. So there are some types, different types of chondroitin sulfates. Diverging from hyaluronan in three key aspects. Other glycosaminoglycans are typically shorter polymers. Form covalent bonds with specific proteins to create proteoglycans and may have different monomeric units compared to hyaluronan. So there are three typical differences. Shorter polymers because hyaluronan has longer polymer, is a longer polymer. And the others form covalent bonding with specific proteins to create the proteoglycans and may have different monomeric units compared to hyaluronan. And the chondroitin sulfates are glycosaminoglycans, enhancing the tensile strength of cartilage, tendons, ligaments, and the aorta. And there are three types of chondroitin sulfates. Chondroitin sulfate A, B, now it is called as dermatin sulfate, and chondroitin sulfate C. And the, the name is derived from the Greek word chondros, which meaning cartilage. And they are usually attached to proteins, as I said, as a form of Protoglycans and chondroitin sulfate A and C are similar to each other. So it occurs by repeating glycuronic acid and N acetyl galactosamine. So the chondroitin sulfate, I'm talking about A and C, chondroitin A and C. They occur by repeating glycuronic acid and N acetyl galactosamine. Here we have the N acetyl galactosamine. So this part is similar with hyaluronan, but this is different. In hyaluronan, this it is N acetyl glucosamine here, galactosamine. And in both, the, the one carries sulfate is the N acetyl galactosamine. The monosaccharide genes are linked to each other by repeating beta-1-3 and beta-1-4 glycosidic bond. The difference between them is due to the difference in the carbon atom which the sulfates belong. In A, chondroitin sulfate A, the sulfate group is attached to carbon-4, where in chondroitin sulfate C, the carbon-6 or the carbon six has the sulfate group. So this is the difference between A and C. In chondroitin sulfate B, which is now called as dermatin sulfate, which con and uh, the dermatin here, the dermis comes from the derma, which means skin, contributes to the pliability of skin and is also present in blood vessels and heart valves. In this polymer, many of the glycuronate residues present in chondroitin sulfate, as in A and C, are replaced by their 5 epimer. Remember what means epimer from the previous topics, as well as in organic chemistry, the stereoisomerism topic. And it is the l idoronate l idoronate or shortly idoronic acid. And the presence of idoronic acid in dermatin sulfate distinguishes it from other chondroitin sulfates 
which contains chronic acid instead. And this structural difference influences the unique properties and functions of dermatin sulfate. Dermatin sulfate plays a crucial role in providing resilience in and flexibility to connective tissues. Its ability to interact with proteins and form proteoglycans contributes to the structural integrity of various organs and tissues. In the skin, dermatin sulfate is involved in maintaining elasticity and hydration. Keratin sulfates, another type of glycosaminoglycan. Keratin sulfates is a linear polymer consisting of a repeating disaccharide unit, the galactose and n glucosamine. And one or both can be carbon six sulfates. So keratin sulfates have galactose plus N acetyl glucosamine as a uh, as a repeating disaccharide unit. Unlike some other glycosaminoglycans, keratin sulfates do not contain uronic acid in their structure. Okay, there's no uronic acid. Uh, instead, they consist of alternating glucose and N acetyl glucosamine or galactose and N acetyl galactosamine disaccharide unit. The sulfate content of keratin sulfates can vary, making them unique among glycosaminoglycan. And this variability in sulfate groups contributes to the diverse functions and properties of keratin sulfates in different tissues. Keratin sulfates appear as a proteoglycan in which keratin sulfate chains are attached to cell surface or extracellular matrix protein, ECMs. Keratin sulfates are found in the cornea, cartilage, bone, and various rigid structures composed of disease cells, such as horn, hair, hooves, nails, and claws. Keratin sulfates are commonly found in tissues that require structural rigidity, rigidity, and resilience. They are prominent in the cornea of the eye, where they contribute to the maintenance of transparency and the structural integrity of the tissue. Additionally, keratin sulfates are present in cartilage, bone, and various dove structures formed from dead cells such as horn, hair, hooves, nails, and claws. Heparan sulfate. Heparan sulfate is a linear polysaccharide found in all animal tissues. It occurs as a proteoglycan where two or three heparan sulfate chains are attached in close proximity to the cell surface or extracellular matrix protein. And it is named after the Greek hepar, meaning liver, due to its initial isolation from the liver of dogs. And it's synthesized by all animal cells, firstly identified uh, or isolated in liver cells, hepar. It consists of diverse arrangements of sulfated and non sulfated sugars. And approximately 50% of its structure is glycronic acid plus N acetyl glucosamine as a repeating disaccharide unit. And the sulfated segments along the chain enable extensive interactions with numerous proteins, including growth factors, components of the extracellular matrix, and various enzymes and factors found in plasma. It regulates a wide variety of biological activities, including development processes, angiogenesis, blood coagulation, elimination of cleavage activity by granzym B and tumor metastasis. And granzym B is one of the serine protease granzymes most commonly found in the granules of natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells. Heparan sulfate has been shown to serve as a cellular receptor for a number of viruses, including respiratory syncytial virus.
and it stands for heparin. Heparin is a glycosaminoglycan, another GAC, and an anticoagulant, meaning it inhibits blood, blood clotting. It inhibits blood clotting. Heparin derived predominantly from muscle cells, except type of leukocyte, is a fractionated form of heparin sulfate. And the difference from heparin sulfate is much more sulfate. And it's it, heparin is a linear polysaccharide made up of repeating the saccharide units. And the, the predominant saccharide units in heparin consist of uronic acid, either hydronic or glycronic acid, and glucosamine. Heparin acts as an anticoagulant by enhancing the activity of antithrombin-3, a natural inhibitor of blood clotting factors. The binding of heparin induces antithrombin to interact with and inhibit thrombin, a crucial protease in the blood clotting process. The interaction is notably electrostatic, with heparin possessing the highest negative charge density among all known biological macrobiomes. As a preventive measure against clotting, Purified heparin is routinely introduced into both clinical blood samples and donated blood for transfusion. And we use heparinized uh, blood, blood tubes or blood tubes containing heparin uh, in laboratory analysis to obtain a whole blood, a blood which is not clotted. Peptidoglycans. Bacterial and algal cell walls contain structural heteropolysaccharide, and they are peptidoglycans. The peptidoglycan, a key structural component of bacterial cell walls, consists of a heteropolymer composed of alternating N-acetylglycosamine and N-acetylmuromic acid residues linked through beta-1-4 glycosidic linkage. It is also called as murane. Murane. It's a, and as you see in the picture, look at a bacterial cell, a bacteria which has a cell membrane, similar to the animal cell, and a difference between here is the cell wall, which is composed of peptidoglycan. And as you see, there are linear polymers aligned alongside each other in the bacterial cell wall. And they are held together by short peptides whose specific composition varies among bacterial species. And here is the peptide, shortest, shorter peptide. And these peptide crosslinks create a robust sheath called peptidoglycan that encases the entire cell safeguarding it from swelling and bursting when exposed to osmotic pressure changes caused by water entry. A perfect illustration showing the structural arrangement of the peptidoglycan network provided by the creative proteomics, thanks to them. And here you see the linear polymers consist of glucosamine and n muromic acid as a building blocks, a linear polymer, which they forms connection with the peptide chains to provide a robust network. And here is you see the pentaglycine crosslink of five glycine here, and also alanine, glutamic acid, lysine, and another alanine residues. And lysozyme, the enzyme, which is found in human tears, for example, human tears, plays a pivotal role in combating bacterial infections. It accomplishes this by breaking the beta-1-4, breaks the beta-1-4 glycosidic bonds between N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuramic acid. Additionally, certain bacterial viruses produce lysozyme to facilitate their release from the host bacterial cell 
an essential step in the viral infection cycle. Penicillin and related antibiotics, retmelite, right, the penicillin, and related antibiotics effectively eliminate bacteria by inhibiting the formation of these cross links, rendering the cell wall too fragile with, to withstand osmotic pressure and ultimately leading to bacterial cell lysis. Agar. Some marine red algae, including certain seaweed varieties, possesses cell walls enriched with agar. A complex blend of sulfated heteropolysaccharide consisting of D-galactose and an L-galactose derivative that are linked, that are ether linked between carbon atoms 3 and 6. Agar compromises a diverse range of polysaccharides all sharing a common foundational structure, but differing in their levels of sulfate and pyruvate substitution. Agarose is the agar component with the fewest charge groups, sulfate and pyruvate, and its molecular weight is approximately 150,000 Dalton. It is so the remarkable gel forming property of agarose makes it useful in the biochemistry lab. When an acute suspension of agarose is subjected to a heating cooling process, the agarose molecules intertwine to create a double helix structure. Two molecules align in a parallel manner forming a helix with a repeating pattern of three residues, while water molecules become encapsulated within the central hull of space. These structures subsequently aggregate to create a gel, a three-dimensional framework that retains substantial amounts of water. Agarose gels serve as the inert supports in the electrophoretic separation of nucleic acid a crucial step in the DNA sequencing process. Agar is also employed to establish a surface conducive for the cultivation of bacterial colonies. In addition, agar finds commercial utility in crafting capsules for certain vitamins and drugs. The dehydrated agar material is sold readily in the stomach and has no metabolic impact. And here you see the diagram of agarose gel electrophoresis. And agarose gel electrophoresis is a common laboratory technique used for separation and analysis of nucleic acids, such as DNA and RNA, based on their size and charge. And let me to explain the overview of the process briefly. But the first one is the preparation of the gel. And here you see the agarose gel. And we define the agarose, a polysaccharide extracted from seaweed. And it is mixed with the buffer solution and heated until it dissolves. The hot liquid agarose is then poured into a casting tray, as you see here, the casting tray, where it solidifies to form a gel with small wells or slots at one end. And here you see the wells. And we put in an electrophoretic buffer, and also we have a cathode and anode and a power supply in the system. The second step is loading the samples. The DNA or RNA samples typically mixed with the loading dye for visualization and they are carefully loaded into the wells of the agarose gel. Here with the sample contained in RNA, loaded into the walls. And there is a dye, which makes us to visualize them. 
and two step is electrophoresis. The gel is submerged in an electrophoresis chamber with a buffer solution, which we call it electrophoretic buffer. An electrical current, as you see here, we have a power supply, is applied across the gel, causing negatively charged DNA or RNA molecules to move through the gel towards the positively charged electrode. So DNA, RNA, negatively charged, and they move towards to the positively charged anode. The rate of movement is inversely proportional to the size of the molecules, the smaller molecules move faster through the gel, while larger, man, larger ones move more slowly. And at the fourth step, as you see here, we see the band, low molecular weight and high molecular weight surfaces are analyzed. And the special dyes make it possible. So after electrophoresis, the gel is stained with a dye that binds to DNA and RNA, or RNA. And the stained bands of DNA or RNA appear as a distinct horizontal lines on the gel is seen in here, horizontal line. The position and separation of these bands provide information about the sizes of the nucleic acid fragments. The results are analyzed by comparing the pattern of bands in the gel to a set of known standards, which we call them molecular weight markers. And this allows researchers to estimate the size of the DNA or RNA fragments in the sample. Agarose gel electrophoresis is a fundamental technique in molecular biology and is used for various applications, including DNA fingerprinting, DNA purification, checking the success of PCR reactions, and verifying the integrity of the nucleic acid samples. It is a valuable tool for research, diagnostics, and quality control in the life sciences. Yes, Gum Arabic. Gum Arabic, also known as Acacia Gum, is a natural plant exudate or sub obtained from various species of Acacia trees, particularly Acacia Senegal and Acacia Thea. It's a complex mixture of water soluble, branch acidic heteropolysaccharides, and glycoprotein. It is constituted arabinos, galactose, rhamnose, and glycoronic acid. Gum arabic is one of the widely used compounds in the pharmaceutical and food industries. It is often used as a thickening, emulsifying, and stabilizing agent in food and beverage products. And the last polysaccharide, the last heteropolysaccharide is pectin. Pectin is a complex polysaccharide found in the primary cell walls of plants, particularly in the green parts of terrestrial plants. It serves as a key constituent of the middle lamella, playing a role in cell adhesion. In plant cell structures, Pectin is a heteropolysaccharide that is prominently found in the primary cell wall and the middle lamella. It can make up a significant portion of the cell wall, accounting for approximately 30% of its composition. Plants exhibit three primary pectin domains, namely homogalacturonan, rhamnogalacturonan 1, and rhamnogalacturonan 2. Additionally, kisilogalacturonan and apiogalacturonan are often classified as pectins due to their shared structural backbone with homogalacturonan. The primary building block of pectin is alpha 14 galacturonic acid. And my dear friends, we finish the topic.
And here were the references at last year to obtain one of them for further study. The next topic is lipids one, lipids part one. And you can visit my website, biochemia.quet, and also you can follow my Instagram account for more about biochemistry, clinical biochemistry, laboratory world, and also in academic life. And my dear friends, don't forget to subscribe to the Biochemia Vet YouTube channel, to like the videos, and turn on notifications to stay up to date. See you in our next topic. Goodbye.